social misconception is that Islam <coughs> is opposed to democracy. You know, usually Western society likes to hold up democracy as being the ideal, this is where people's rights are ensured, freedom, liberty, justice to all, democracy. Whereas Islam is opposed to this democracy. Well, the reason why Islam does not accept democracy as it is portrayed from a Western point of view is that the laws fundamentally come or should come from God. If it's a question of the group of people deciding what's right and what's wrong, then you're going to find right and wrong varying. You know, with every, every 10 years or every 4 years, every time you change administration, whatever, you have a new set of what is right and a new set of what is wrong. So the state, the society is in a constant flux. You know, they say good and evil are relative. Whereas the Islamic view is that no, good and evil are absolute. They're not relative. What is evil is evil. No matter where you are, when it takes place, it's evil. It is evil to commit adultery a thousand years ago and it is evil today. It's evil to fornicate a thousand years ago and it's evil to fornicate today. So the laws are stable. They don't change. These things which are clearly defined by God, these man has no right to play with. So this is why you can't have democracy as we know it or as it is portrayed in the Western context. Because man has no right to interfere and make these laws. He has a right to deal with certain other social, in the application of the law, certain social circumstances, you know, if he wants to put traffic lights or you know, building codes for houses and these type of things, man has the right to agree as a group, democratically, as to what uh, may be done. And Islam encourages that. However, it is encouraged as long as it does not contravene any of the divine laws. So democracy is encouraged in a limited sense, you know, within the sphere which doesn't affect the absolute good and the absolute evil. And when you practically look at the Western democracies, to be very honest, what is put on the rule books is not what is really in practice. Because, for example, here, and in other uh, countries, Muslim countries, education is free from kindergarten to PhD. Some people say, well, it's here in Saudi Arabia because they have so much money. But no, in the Sudan, it is free from kindergarten to PhD, and they don't have so much money. Because the society, Islam, teaches that it is the fundamental right of every citizen to be educated. When education is limited to one segment of the society, you can study up to grade 12. After high school, now you've got to pay. Then it means that it becomes the exclusive right of a certain segment of the society. You know, this is a class society. And America, if the masses of the people were given the choice. Should we have free education from kindergarten to PhD? You can be certain that the masses of the people will say yes. But it's not there. It's not there. And this is a basic help. If the masses of the people were asked, should we have free health care? The majority will say yes, but we don't have it. Is it because the people don't want it? No, they want it. 
Is it because America is too poor? No. America is the richest country on this earth right now. In terms of the control of resources, it is the richest. It could provide free education for all of its citizens and free health care for all of its citizens. It could do this. But it does not. And, you know, of course, these are for political reasons, whatever, you know, one could get into. But I'm just bringing this to, to point out, on the other hand, that those people who maybe make the biggest noise about democracy, when you actually go and look into the situation where democracy is supposed to be functioning, you find that there are big question marks here. Is there really a democracy here? Or is it just a kind of a routine that people go through every four years, or whatever, you know? We are going to elect a new this one and a new that one. But in fact, the decisions are made, you know, behind uh, closed doors or, you know, behind the scenes. Another misconception here, common, is that um, Western women should avoid Muslim males because they will molest them. You know, women are told, if you see some, I know some groups have been told, this, this has been related to me, directly and indirectly. Uh, women have been told, if you are, you know, coming down the street, you see some Muslim males on this side, better to go on the other side because they will pinch your behinds or whatever. You know. In reality, I mean, it's not to say that not some people will do it. Yes, there are some. But this is not the case of the majority of the male. This is not true. I mean, they will not molest women. This is not the, the norm. You find exceptions, but it's not the norm. And those people who have, you know, lived here long enough and been around different parts of the kingdom, you know, can attest to the reality is that this is not the case at all. I will add that you have an element, for example, who tends to look at the Western woman as being a loose woman easy to get, you flash some money in her face, you come up with a big car, and she'll jump in your car and go where you want her to go. This is a misconception going the other way. This is a result of those people watching videos and movies coming from America. But it, it's American propaganda, unfortunately. America has portrayed its women in the movies and videos, etc., in this fashion. And these individuals uh, you know, deviant or corrupt individuals, and this is what they have accepted. And even others who are not necessarily deviant or corrupt, but they, you know, they have been exposed to some degree to media presentation of American women, and that's the impression that they get, you know. It's unfortunate, it's not true, you know, because the fact that uh, the women may not be dressing in certain fashions, etc., uh, it doesn't mean that the majority of them are loose or easy or whatever. In the last uh, misconception I'd just like to mention is one that, um, you know, Saudis, when they have their uh, Mercedes and Jaguars, etc., when they drive along, when the car breaks down, they just leave it on the side of the road, they go to a new uh, car show and buy a new car and keep moving. You know, this is one which is a uh, it may appear that way if you see cars stalled on the side of the road, etc. But uh, this is not the practice of the people here that they uh, do this. Uh, I'm not saying that there may not be some individuals, but this is not the general practice of the population. They try to get some mechanics to get it fixed or whatever. They don't just, you know, people are not, you know, every person here is not walking around with a million dollars in his pocket. You, know, you have rich and you have poor. There are different levels of the society. Uh, in closing, you know, because this is the last of the points I want to mention, just in order to give you all an opportunity also to uh, uh, give me some feedback, uh, and discuss some of the ideas that uh, you may have, or comments that you may want to make on some things that I said. Uh, I'd just like to mention that um, the reasons for these misconceptions are varied. Some of them are due to misinformation which may be deliberate, you know, on the part of some individuals, may have uh, religious orientation, 
some people for fear of the spread of Islam, etc., you know, may make some stories about Muslims. Some people still reeling from the defeats of the crusade, you know, still look at the Muslims as these, you know, warring folks that we have to hold off or hold at bay. And sometimes it's inadvertent, you know, people misinterpreting uh, cultural practices here. Uh, we had, uh, for example, one uh, misconception which uh, was spread amongst uh, some of the military people who were here that, you know, uh, what the, you see these uh, Arabs here, they're drinking chai and coffee all the time, tea and coffee. You know, they, 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 they put uh, hashish and cocaine in their uh, drinks, you know, that's what they're drinking actually. Some of the, the guys who tried it out and didn't get high were a little disappointed, you know. We, we thought you all had some, something good going here, you know. But uh, what happened? You, you're not giving me any? Well, you know, actually, these uh, are not uh, intoxicating uh, drinks. For those of you who may still be under this misconception. Uh, and this is, as I said, due to misinterpretation or possibly deliberate uh, misinformation. We also have another source, which is an unfortunate source, you know, particularly from a Muslim point of view, and that is due to distorted Muslim practices. You'll find some individuals who are associated with Islam, may call themselves Muslims, may come to the West, you know, like I, I remember one particular individual in, in uh, Florida, he built a home there with, you know, all kinds of pornographic scenes on the walls of his home, you know, they went in Time Magazine and Life did a special study of his, his uh, palace, you know. Uh, you know, it was very gross, and, but then this becomes associated with Muslims and Islam, you know. Uh, so we can say due to some incorrect, distorted practices of Muslims, uh, this has created, this has been a source of also missing uh, misinformation or uh, misconceptions concerning Islam and Muslims. So in closing, I would just like to recap that the popular misconceptions uh, vary from misconceptions concerning beliefs, concerning who God is, who prophets are, where the Quran came from, etc. Some of them concern religious practices, divorce, polygamy, oppression of women, etc. And some of them uh, concern social practices, where terrorism is attributed to Muslims, them being opposed to democracy, etc. But if a person honestly wants to find out and a, a person who has been brought here by the destiny of God, I feel it's his duty to find out. If the person wants to, they can, by seeking, by discussing with people, they can find out the truth behind the various misconceptions that they may have concerning the practices of Muslims. Muslims are quite open, willing to discuss uh, various aspects of their social or, or religious practices. Uh, not necessarily that they're trying to convert you, you know, if it means if you ask one question, all of a sudden if you, people feel, oh yes, he, he wants to become a Muslim, so I'm going to convert him to Islam. No. But their willingness to share what they have is part of the commandments of the religion in that we are in all enjoyed to convey the message of what Islam is to people and then it's up to them to choose what they wish for themselves because there can be no compulsion in religion this is a statement from the Quran itself and uh, Muslims historically have followed that principle I will stop here now and uh, allow you a chance to either ask questions directly from the floor uh, we don't, we don't, we don't want to necessarily restrict people to writing questions, not because you know we don't want to find any strange questions coming up, but.
just that uh, for some people they may be a bit shy to express themselves directly, they prefer to do so in writing, so we're taking written questions. But uh, if you have a question from the floor that you would like to raise by just raising your hand, you know, you can be uh, allowed to uh, get your question off or your comment. But uh, before we go into it, I'd just like to say that um, I would like to give the opportunity first and foremost to those people who are not Muslims because the purpose of this was to clear up misconceptions about Muslims and I know there are many Muslims here and there's a tendency that you know in these kind of sessions for Muslims to monopolize the questions and comments and thereby not allow their guests, the non-Muslims, to express themselves you know, freely. So I would ask you all, those of you who are Muslims here, please uh, hold back the questions and allow those uh, people who are non-Muslims to express or to ask whatever they would like. And if we run out of uh, questions, then you would like to raise some comments or whatever, then you may be free to do so. One of my confining friends, he asked me that Muslims are trying to own Allah. I said, no. He said, why then you are using the Allah on the tower of the past? This is what I put up here. The second thing was that why you kiss the Ahiriya Swarma when you go home? These are two measurement misconceptions in their environment. I want to clear them tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, the first uh, question concerns the new moon, which is a symbol found on the top of many mosques. You know, what is the religious significance of this? Actually, there is no religious significance. You know, a person might think, having seen it on the top of many mosques, that it is like the equivalent of like the cross. The cross is the symbol of Christianity, the star of David being the symbol of Judaism, that this Hilal, as it's called in Arabic, Hilal, or this new crescent moon shape, is the symbol of Muslims, but in fact it is not. There is no uh, basis from the teachings of the religion concerning it. I mean, what, what I mean to say is, if I were to take a cross and break it in front of a Christian, likely he would get very upset. If I were to take a star of David and stomp on it in front of a Jew, he would likely also get very upset. But if you take a a crescent and stomp on it or break it or it means nothing. To a Muslim it means nothing really. It doesn't have that religious significance. It has become a cultural uh, symbol uh, because of the fact that the Muslim calendar follows the lunar calendar where the crescent moon is significant in identifying the coming in of Ramadan, the month of fasting, the ending of Ramadan, the time for Hajj, it becomes, the, the crescent becomes important in terms of being sighted. It, you know, some five or six hundred years ago uh, became a popular symbol used uh, by the Ottomans in their, in their building structures and it spread over the Muslim world because they were the ones ruling the Muslim world at the time. But it has no, if you go back to the time, early generations of Muslims, the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, may God peace and blessings be upon him, and the early generations after him, this uh, symbol was not used at all. And so you will find mosques uh, in many parts of the world that don't use it. It's not a part of their of the structure. And there's no problem with it. Oh, the other question which uh, our brother here raised, you know, concerning 
the kissing of the black stone, or this is the uh, that corner of the Kaaba, the structure, which is the first house of worship built, as I mentioned earlier, by Prophet Abraham. Now, the structure as we see it is a rebuilt structure. Muslims are not under the delusion that the exact structure we see is what was built by Prophet Abraham. No. It was built in that approximate shape. It wasn't quite like that. It, it fell down in time, was rebuilt, and broke, fell back down and rebuilt, uh, caught a fire and was rebuilt. It was rebuilt over the years, over the centuries. However, the only part of it which we consider to be a part of the original structure was the part known now as the black stone in that corner, which is surrounded by a frame, a silver frame. And you see people, it is tradition to start the circumambulation of the uh, structure of the Kaaba, walking around it, by first kissing that stone. And it has no more significance than the Pope kissing the ground before he gets on the airplane or kissing the ground when he gets off the airplane. You know, uh, it is one of the, the rites which is, if one is able to do so, one does so uh, because the Prophet had taught us to do so as part of the rites of Hajj. It signifies the beginning point uh, for, the, for the circumambulation and the ending point at the same time. So you could say similarly to the Pope kissing the ground when he begins his journey and kissing the ground when he ends his journey, you know, uh, thanking God for giving him the strength to uh, take that part in that journey. And Muslims uh, kiss the stone signifying the beginning and the end as they were taught by the Prophet. Uh, question, why in Islam you don't consider Prophet Muhammad as your Lord and Savior like Christians do in the case of Jesus? Well, this is because the teachings of the Quran have been very clear and explicit in explaining that the Prophet Muhammad, may God peace and blessing be upon him, was only a man, a human being, who had no power to save man and that in fact even these powers which were attributed to Prophet Jesus these were false powers no man has the ability to save another man to absolve another man of his sins this power belongs only to God the other part of the question why don't you call uh, your religion Mohammedanism because Mohammedanism, for one, implies somehow the worship of Muhammad. And this, of course, is totally out of the question. And actually, the main reason is because God defined the name of the religion in the Quran. The name of the religion is not something which people agreed upon hundreds or thousands of years after the time of the Prophet, but something which was defined specifically in the Quran itself. You will find in the Quran where God says that the religion with God is Islam. Submission to the will of God. The religion of Abraham. The religion of Adam. The religion of all the Prophets. So God has defined what and who that religion uh, belongs to what is that religion, what it entails, what it means, and what is its name. I have 
Actually, even in the Old Testament, in the, um, you know, in the five books of Moses, uh, both Jewish and Christian scholars do not accept this as being pure revelation. Because there's a story there, for example, wherein it is described, because this was supposed to be revelation to Prophet Moses, it's described that, you know, Moses, he died at this point and he was buried. So on. Was that revelation to Moses? No. Nobody's going to say that. <laughs> you, you, this is there in the Bible and there, there are a number of instances there where it is obvious that this is uh, you know uh, human writings and Jewish scholars don't argue that point I mean just the you know the Old Testament the, the Torah uh, I mean this was lost rewritten from memory you know Ezra rewritings and, you know I mean the, the, there's so much evidence to indicate that there's no way that one could honestly claim, whether Old Testament or New Testament, that this is 100% the Word of God. I mean, all you have to do is look at the, you know, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, compare it to the King James Version, and see in the footnotes all of the verses which have been deleted. I mean, you've got no end of verses. And they explain why, because this is not in the earliest manuscripts and so on. So they've been deleted out. No. Well, I, I think the final analysis, it boils down to a matter of knowledge. You see, if a person doesn't have knowledge about a thing, then he may have faith in it, though it be false. But if he has correct knowledge about the thing, then when he has faith in it, he is, his faith is, is correct faith. Because a person can have faith in anything. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the thing is right or it's good. So, ultimately, I mean, if we consider ourselves to be seekers of the truth, those who seek to please God, to worship God, etc., then our priority should be knowledge and then faith. This is our, I mean, this is the Islamic approach. And I, I think it is a valid approach. That knowledge should precede faith. In the sense that you need to know who God is before you can worship Him and have faith in Him. If you don't know who God is, if you're just brought up in an environment, for example, you're born in India, where people, you know, worship the main god, uh, you know, Brahma, who is represented in different forms. You know, Shiva is the uh, most common and favored representation. And Shiva in, in Banaras and in, in other parts of India is represented as a, as, a, as a penis called Lingam. And this is an object of worship. Now, a person who is born and grows up in this worship he may have very strong faith in his worship. But if he has no knowledge, if he doesn't reflect and question and seek, then his faith is useless. So, the Islamic view 
which I believe is you know, quite reasonable, is that one needs to know first who God is. Knowing who God is in the sense, not merely of what has been written about God, but what makes sense about God too. Because God has given us an intellect, a sense of right and wrong. So we're not just he's sort of blindly obliged to accept anything simply because it has been ascribed or called to be scripture. We have reason. So we use our reason, we research, we gather information. What we find after that research to be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, then we should put our faith in it, trust it, our full emotions behind it, support it, die for it if necessary. A few months back, in one of the lectures which were being read somewhere in the base, uh, there was an occasion where one of the listeners came up with an uh, explanation about uh, Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Uh, it came to my ears that even the, 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 the term God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or God the Holy... Uh. A few months back, in one of the lectures which were being read somewhere in the base, uh, there was an occasion where one of the listeners came up with an uh, explanation about uh, Jesus Christ being the Son of God. Uh, it came to my ears that even the, 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 the term God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or God the Holy uh, Ghost, I couldn't fathom that. Uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, I, I would like to ask the origin of this misconception. It is very clear. All who Allah has said God is one. I would like to ask if, if it's well, again, the issues of the Trinity, you know, may be understood through historical research. Those who go back into the history and read the origins of, you know, uh, doctrines of, of Christianity, they will find that there was a particular point in time, historically 325 AD, Council of Nicaea, where the principle or the concept of the Trinity came into uh, full force. It was accepted as being the belief that the Christian should hold. There was a struggle at that time between the Unitarians led by Arius, the Bishop of Alexandria, who upheld the concept of God being one and, and rejected the Trinitarian concept. But he was defeated at this council and in subsequent uh, uh, gatherings. And he and his followers were persecuted. Their books were burnt. The Gospels which supported their ideas were uh, uh, described as apocryphal and, and, and destroyed. And the, from that point onward, the Trinitarian uh, belief became the standard belief. You know, the Nicene Creed becomes the standard belief of Christians. Although you do find people who consider themselves to be Christians today who do not uh, support it. People like the Jehovah's Witness, they consider themselves to be Christians. But uh, of course, you know, mainstream Christianity considers themselves them to have deviated. They hold that you know, Jesus, there is no trinity, that, you know, uh, Jesus was in fact a creating son. So you will find uh, different groups that, you know, that spring up from time to time who may lean back towards the Unitarian uh, concept. And even the Unitarian church, you know, has, has carried on from that time, maybe in certain areas. Uh, though today when you look at Unitarian beliefs, it seems uh, uh, quite a far cry from those uh, original ideas expressed by Arius. Our uh, question is Jesus' father's name mentioned in the Quran. 
Well, actually in the Quran, there is no mention that Jesus had a father. Uh, Mary is described as a righteous woman who worshipped God, fasted, etc. And she had a child without being married at all. So there is no possibility of any kind of a doubt as to the origin of Jesus in that uh, Mary was born, Jesus was born without a father in, in, in the most absolute and purest sense. And uh, in the Quran it is stated that when Mary gave birth, uh, you know, God had sent an angel to her who had informed her that uh, she should point to the child when uh, she is questioned about this birth, you know, when people would come to her and as they did and question her for what appeared to have been a major sin of adultery or fornication, etc. So when they did, when she did bring the child and they did question her, she pointed to the child and according to the statements in the Quran, Jesus spoke as a child newborn, spoke defending his mother, saying that she was a chaste woman, was devout, devout in worshipping the one true God, and that he himself was a prophet of God. So we actually believe that Jesus' uh, prophet, prophethood began with his birth. And we believe in this miracle of him speaking as a child, a newborn child, which is not even a part of our Christian tradition. There is a, a verse in the Quran where God is described as blowing in the human being a portion of his spirit. This is how it is often translated. And uh, this some people have mistakenly taken to mean that uh, the human spirit is a part of the divine spirit that uh, man has within him a part of the divine. However, this translation is not really an accurate translation of the, the, the Arabic text because the Arabic text has to be taken in context with the explanations given by the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. And he explained that uh, when the child is developing in the womb of the mother, when he reaches the beginning of the fifth month, an angel is sent who blows in him the spirit. And that the spirit itself is from the command of God, God's command of be and it is the creation. The human spirit is created, whereas God is uncreated. We do not believe that God is a spirit or that he has a spirit. He is beyond his creation. He is not, he does not share the qualities of his creation. So a more accurate translation really would be that uh, God commanded his angels or an angel to blow in man from the spirit that he created. His spirit not meaning a part of his own spirit but one of the spirits which he created which are his. It's like he refers to his prophets. You know he refers to his houses meaning the mosques. You know and the term, the, the possessive uh, pronoun, you know, his, does not necessarily indicate that the thing described is actually a part of, but it could be possessed by, as in the difference between his book and his hand. His hand means it's part of him. His book is not a part of him, but something which he possesses. Similarly, when it refers to his spirit, it's not referring to a part of God because God has elsewhere explained that the spirit was created and as such we cannot, uh, we do not accept the concept that hu a human being has within him, within his body, the spirit or a portion of the spirit of God. 
Uh, one question. Uh, I want to become a Muslim, but I'm married. Uh, that my wife, children, friends would stand against me. Uh, it is a real challenge, I guess. What is your advice? Well, one has to choose if one is convinced that Islam is in fact the true religion of God, this is the path that God has ordained for man, then such a person has to make that choice. And he cannot or she cannot, you know, be diverted by what the consequences they fear may happen because God is in control of one's destiny. One may die tomorrow. Uh, what reactions one expected may not be. There's a variety of different things, you know, could take place. So my advice to the, to the person who wrote this is that if you want to become a Muslim, you should do so. Uh, you may not want to reveal it to those people who you fear may have a negative reaction in the initial stages, you can reveal it to them gradually. But of course, amongst Muslims, you should be known. That is, your family says not here, they're back in the Philippines or they're back in America or wherever. You know, you don't necessarily have to tell them immediately. But when, if you believe that this is the path for you, then you should declare your faith amongst Muslims. So you're known. Because the declaration of faith is really for your own uh, protection to help you as an individual so that uh, people know you to be a Muslim so if they see you falling by the wayside you know your faith getting weak in terms of your practice etc that they would uh, look out for you uh, offer help or whatever uh, question there is five times uh, daily compulsory prayer but professionally, I'm a cook, and I work in a hot galley. Uh, and I guess uh, it looks like you're saying, uh, and I'm sweating, you know, the hot place, right? It's very hard to make ablution uh, that could cause sickness. So what should uh, I do or we do? Well. The point is that uh, the five times daily prayer this is something which is fundamental for a Muslim, which he's obliged to do, you know, as the foundation for his life. It's, it's, it's the ordering of his daily 24-hour life. This doesn't mean that this is the only time he can pray, but he prays to God as much as he can. But at least this is the minimum that he should stick by. Now, there is a concession given under certain circumstance where the midday prayer and the afternoon prayer may be joined. The sunset prayer and the night prayer may also be joined together. So a person who finds himself in a situation where it becomes virtually impossible for health reasons or whatever to make one of those prayers, he may join it with the other prayer with, to which he's allowed to join. For example, a, a doctor is going into heart surgery. He has an operation which is going to take five hours. It's going to, you know, run through a couple of the time, prayer times, you know. Then he is allowed to join those prayers. Uh, the, the, the sunset prayer may be joined with the late night prayer which can be prayed, you know, all the way up into the middle of the night and beyond. And the midday prayer and the afternoon prayer, afternoon prayer can be brought forward and prayed along with the midday prayer. So such a person, for example, he must get a break for lunch. When he gets the break for lunch, he may pray that midday prayer along, along with his afternoon prayer in such a case. You know, where if, in fact, the situation is such that if he were to make ablution, that, you know, because of the heat of the circumstance that he's working in, that this could create some kind of sickness. Although, I, I mean, I, I question really, um, I mean, whether a person would be sick under these circumstances. Perhaps maybe if the water is extremely cold, you know, and then, and then maybe you might find yourself in a situation, but the water here, I mean, you have um, lukewarm water. I don't see where it should really create a problem. 
I mean, I would want to be certain from a medical point of view before, you know, taking a concession like that. Okay, there are a number of other questions, but, you know, we've been informed that uh, we are late, we started late, and we have gone over the, uh, the allotted time, especially in considering that uh, dinner has been prepared for, for us to, to eat. So um, uh, I would like to close things down now, maybe with the last question uh, concerning the misconception of laboring Muslims as fundamentalists. You know, just uh, to point out to you that uh, the idea of calling for the establishment of Islam as a way of life in areas where Muslims are the majority, such people are labeled, generally speaking, as fundamentalists. People who want to uh, make Islam uh, the law of the society, or the law guiding the society as a whole. They're referred to as being fundamentalists, but in fact, this is just basically Islamic. It is something which is ordained by Islam. And those people who have accepted secular systems or don't feel it's necessary that the rule of Islam be the rule of the, the country where Muslims are a majority, such people have deviated from Islam. There is no such thing really as fundamental Islam. It's just Islam. It's very clear in Islamic teachings that the laws of a country should be according to the laws of God. There are no, there's no separation between uh, the religious community and the secular community, or religious laws and secular laws. It is all integrated. So with that, I would just like to thank you all for coming this evening, and I hope that what has been said and discussed has been in some way beneficial to you all. And uh, I would hope that Allah uh, gives us an opportunity to meet again sometime in the future. And if I've said anything which uh, any of you have found offensive, uh, please know that it was not my intention to be offensive. Uh, I'm just trying to talk as, as straightforward and as openly as possible. And um, God alone knows that uh, my intention was not to hurt anybody's feelings, but only to try to convey and to clarify certain conceptions which uh, lie around Islam.